Welcome everyone to our conversation on addiction, sobriety, and art in the time of COVID-19. Uh, we'll allow about 30 seconds here for uh, people to continue to file in. Well, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to begin by introducing uh, the Dean of the Basic Sciences in the School of Medicine, uh, uh, Dean Larry Marnett. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Danny, and welcome everyone this morning and to our conversation today. Many of our events this past year have focused directly on the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we turn our attention to one of our most pressing public health issues, addiction, which has been greatly impacted by the pandemic. Over the last several years, the country has witnessed a startling rise of drug overdose deaths, mostly attributable to the near universal availability of illicit and prescription opioids. While this has been overshadowed by the pandemic, it has only continued to get worse, in part due to the strains on our society produced by COVID-19, loss of loved ones, unemployment, and social isolation. Today, we have the opportunity to hear a conversation about addiction and sobriety from unique perspectives. Our guest is Will Welch, the global editorial director of GQ Magazine. Personal experiences have driven Will to engage on this issue through coverage of diverse addiction topics in GQ. From the pandemic, we've learned just how critical public health messaging and implementation is, specifically through a wear a mask message. The mask of addiction is destigmatization. If we can normalize the idea in the public that addiction is not a moral failing, rather a disease of the brain, increased treatment seeking and availability could have a meaningful effect. In common with the pandemic, we've seen how public health measures can only go so far and basic science is needed for the light at the end of the tunnel. The phenomenally rapid development and implementation of COVID vaccines provides hope in this time, just one year out from the beginning of the pandemic. In parallel, the incredible advancement of neuroscience research technologies provides hope that basic science can make fundamental discoveries in the brain that will provide new strategies for treating addiction to change the arc of this disease. Thus, we're pleased to also have with us today Dr. Danny Winder, Director of the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research, and Dr. Aaron Calipari, an assistant professor in the center and a rising star in the field. I'm now pleased to turn the conversation back to Danny, as well as Aaron and Will. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I'm Danny Winder, I'm a brain scientist and I direct the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research. The VCAR has three primary goals. Uh, one is to make fundamental new discoveries regarding the mechanisms by which drugs and alcohol alter the brain in addiction. Two is to leverage discoveries to improve therapeutic options for the treatment of use disorders. And three is to engage in outreach to destigmatize the discussion of addiction and improve public understanding of the nature of, it, of this disease. We launched the center in the summer of 2016 and moved into VCAR dedicated research space in 2017. Dr. Erin Calipari was then our first recruit to the center in the Department of Pharmacology that year. She's a rising star in the field and we're delighted to have her as an integral part of the center and here with us today. Erin, can you please say a few words about your research interests? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm Erin Calipari. Um, I'm an assistant professor um, in the Addiction Center, like Danny just said. And my work focuses on um, stimulants and how drugs like cocaine change the brain and how this is different between um, men and women. And so we try to understand how sex differences in drug effects make certain um, individuals particularly vulnerable to addiction to try to understand this process. And so we kind of collaborate with everyone in the VCAR to solve these problems. 
Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to also have with us today, Will Welch. Uh, as Larry mentioned, Will is the global director of GQ Magazine and his personal experiences have raised his interest in uh, these topics. Uh, Will, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Maybe you can begin by telling us a little bit about your job and, and what a day in the life looks like for you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Danny, Aaron, thank you so much. And Larry, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Will Welch. Uh, I've been at GQ since 2007. Um, and starting in 2019, uh, became the editor in chief of USGQ and then took on a new role in January of this year as global editorial director because there are 21 editions of GQ around the world. Um, the a day in my life, uh, especially these days now that I have taken on a global role, means getting up at 5:45. Uh, doing some stretches. I have. I now have all sorts of uh, positive, uh, you might call them addictive behaviors, but they're very positively oriented in my routine, uh, uh, which is a contrast to some of my uh, behaviors a few years ago. Um, I, yeah, so I get up early in the morning and these days have a lot of global calls with due to time changes all happen very early. Um, but I'm really just doing a combination of strategy for GQ, uh, what we're trying to accomplish uh, as a magazine and really as a multi-platform media brand. Um, team leadership, um, I have quite a, a large team under me and, and their well-being, especially through uh, the COVID pandemic is absolutely my, my top priority. And then also editorial leadership, which is about uh, story creation and storytelling, again, uh, most famously, I guess, through the print magazine, but these days we're increasingly looking at all of our platforms. So digital, social media, video, and so on. And um, as Larry mentioned um, and Danny mentioned, um, telling stories around and about, and about um, addiction, substance abuse, sobriety, uh, legalization, decriminalization, all of these things have been just an important part of um, the, the, the topics that we've taken on at GQ under my leadership. So um, accordingly, it's just a real thrill and a privilege to me to be able to talk to you guys. This is truly your field and um, I'm in awe of that. And then what we do is more um, storytelling um, that we're very proud of. So I'm excited to have those two things interact today. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. And I mean, really related to that storytelling, you know, in your in your very first issue of, of GQ when you came on board, uh, there was a really interesting piece called Clean mm. uh, that was a synthesis of interviews on sobriety from nine nine musicians ranging from uh, Jason Isbell to Steven Tyler. Yeah. And was it important to you in particular to start with that piece uh, in your time with the with the, the magazine? And and what did you feel were the the takeaways? Yeah, sure. The yeah, when um, I guess it's like anything else, like um, when I became editor in chief, you realize that you only have your first issue um, once. And so everything that's in that issue was incredibly meaningful to me. Um, Frank Ocean was on the cover. Uh, I love his music. And I also love um, some of the boundaries that he's broken down in his career. And then it was also important to me uh, as somebody who myself identifies as clean and really comes from a, a music background to really publish a piece by one of our greatest, most accomplished writers, Chris Heath, who's just an incredible interviewer, where we were essentially looking at the myth of uh, the correlation between substance use and abuse and creativity. So uh, for those of us who are around rock and roll, rap, uh, jazz, drugs and alcohol are just uh, inextricably intertwined with the history of these arts. Um, and through what well, I guess the story that I was looking to explore, and I wanna be clear that at GQ, we don't do activism journalism. So Chris Heath went to the nine musicians that, that you mentioned, Danny, and he sought to have really honest conversations about the relationship between their past drug and alcohol abuse, their journey to, they all currently in the moment, and as we know, these things can change, identified as clean or sober or abstinent on some level, um, how that journey, including the journey of sobriety related to creativity, 
art, songwriting, uh, playing music, etc. And so it was really an open ended exploration. I guess I can say that I hoped what it would do was sort of bust this myth that you have to be high to be creative. Um, and I think, while again, we weren't out to prove that we were out to just explore those ideas. I do think that that's the message that really came came through um, that you don't have to be self destructive to be creative or to be iconic or to be a great artist. And you know, um, this is an issue throughout the arts. It's not just music, but I think rock and roll, hip hop, the part of the myth making um, is it's just so intertwined with drugs, you know. You think about the great jazz musicians, which is like one of America's highest and greatest and most original art form. It's just almost synonymous with heroin use. Um, and the list goes on. So these are the types of things that, um, the, just the uh, one example of the many ways that we've approached the conversation around drugs and alcohol in GQ. Yeah, well, I, I first, I just want to thank you for even focusing on this. I think in the media, there's this conversation just doesn't happen, right? Yes. Especially a conversation with people. Right. It's it's more, you know, about the, the the kind of sensationalization or, but this is this kind of thing I think is the first step to having a conversation about what drug use is, what it means, how people navigate it, what is addiction, what is sobriety. And so like, thank you for just <laughs> doing that. Um, just to- say one thing about that like um it's our pleasure but what one thing and i think aaron this actually um overlaps with some of your work one a, a much broader mission of mine as the the editor of gq is to really break down old ideas of masculinity so we're really interested in gender norms. I think there's a history of glossy fashion magazines like GQ. We're kind of associated with creating or upholding problematic societal norms. So beauty standards, um, uh, you know, men need to be masculine. Women need to be a certain kind of womanly. Um, rather than creating or upholding those norms, it is really the project of me and my team to deconstruct those norms. And so having conversations with men who happen to be famous, because that's kind of our raw material about things that meant, you know, you're supposed to just effortlessly and coolly use drugs and then leave them aside and be creative and be a great family man and all. That's not possible. And so deconstructing those norms is kind of what we're about on a broader level. Right. Well, and, and actually this goes into kind of my, my question. And so I think one thing that's really interesting is kind of thinking about like celebrities and the mm -hmm. role that they play in kind of, and you know, now we have influencers. Mm -hmm. And so I guess like talk about what you see the role of, of these individuals in society is and how they can play a role in breaking down these stigmas for, for gender norms or addiction and kind of how that fits together. Yeah. Well, uh, we just live in a culture that looks to celebrities for pretty much everything these days. And I actually am not here to argue that that's good or bad. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's sort of the raw material that GQ works with. So um, when we have Brad Pitt on the cover, we go to him and we have a conversation about what it was like growing up in the Ozarks, uh, what sort of notions of masculinity were sort of uh, implanted in him in that time. And then what the arc of the development of those notions have been over the course of his life. Um, and if you go back and read that story or two different cover stories we did with him, it totally overlaps with conversations about drugs and alcohol. Um, and really what um, he says is that it turns out that um, the only thing that's cool or masculine or commendable is to be vulnerable. You know, and so that to me is a universal story. It happens to be that in the culture that we live in, you can get more people to pay attention to it if you tell it through the personal life of Brad Pitt. Um, and, you know, I honor him for being being brave enough to talk about these things. It would be much easier to deflect and promote a movie. Um, but the, but these conversations are 
are really important. And so I just sort of take it at face value um, that people are interested in um, engaging with different narratives and messages if they interact with um, these sort of aspirational figures, right, right, rightly or wrongly, that exist in our culture. And um, if I may, there was a really amazing example of this, the um, iconic rapper DMX, uh, who had a lifelong struggle with addiction. He had this really interesting sort of war going on inside of him between his godliness and his um, substance abuse and subsequent legal trouble and so on. Um, he passed away, uh, I think it was last week, if my, I have really faulty chronology, um, if, if, if that's correct. Um, but I was thinking about talking to you guys today and I saw this tweet come into my timeline and it's just such an interesting articulation of why celebrity can matter for the kind of dialogue that we're talking about. So uh, this has 28.3 thousand retweets and almost 90,000 likes. And it's from, I don't know, a random Twitter user that somebody retweeted into my timeline and it says, morning DMX should mean acknowledging the ways we as a society have criminalized addiction. It means acknowledging how our language perpetuates stigmas towards people with substance use disorder. It means moving towards a more supportive world for people with addictions. You know, it like gives me goosebumps to read that. And it was, that was a sentiment that was kind of like coughed up by the internet, shared to over 28,000 times because this rapper, um, well, I don't know that we've seen toxicology reports and so on, but on some level succumbed um, uh, to a lifelong substance abuse struggle. Um, and I just thought, wow, like th that, that's pretty substantial discourse to be encountering ambiently on Twitter um, because, of, you know, you could say because a celebrity passed away. Right. Well, and I think, too, I mean, it also goes to show that I think people are ready to start having this conversation. Right. And thinking about what addiction is and who it affects and seeing how many people it affects and how we actually help them rather than sweeping it under the rug like we have in the past. And so I, I agree. I think social media has been you know, there's some good and bad. But I think one of the good things is it has it has kind of shown us what as a society, we're ready to talk about. And I, and I think this is one thing that we're starting to see as it affects celebrities and other people and people we love and know, like, how do we fix this? And, and I think it's a easier to talk about than solve problem. But I think talking is the first step to figuring out kind of how we're willing to approach it as a society. Yeah. I mean, one question that I would love to hear you guys talk about is, um, I think we've been all more aware than ever through the pandemic of the strengths, uh, let's, I'm gonna call them the strengths and weaknesses of our public health dialogue. Um, of course, COVID being the obvious example, um, which essentially became not a, a meaningful and helpful public health dialogue, but a culture war, I would argue. Um, and how you guys, what role, from, from y'all's perspective as scientists and researchers, does this need to be like a sort of government driven discussion? And then there are like, under that, there are outlets like GQ where we have taken this on as a priority and so on. And, and how do you guys think about the layers of messaging that could contribute to a more evolved um, public understanding of addiction? I think that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll make some comments and then uh, turn it over to, to Aaron. But I think it's really going to be a multi-pronged approach uh, mm -hmm. to, to address this issue, right? That, you know, we see uh, with the pandemic how effective and how effective public health messaging could be so impactful and yet how we've had problems in, in reaching uh, some populations. And you know, it is really uh, similar in many ways with addiction, where we really struggle with destigmatization, but we really desperately need to uh, to increase treatment seeking. We could have so much more uh, uh, impact on the course of this disease if we had uh, a higher in incidence of, of treatment seeking. 
But I'll also say we also need this because we really need to stamp out this myth of a moral failure because too often it's it's used in cynical ways. And for example, with the recent Derek Chauvin trial, uh, using the drugs in the system approach to uh, sort of imply uh, that the, someone somehow is less re is responsible for their own death to me is, is something that that we have to, to get rid of. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so. Uh, from our perspective, we're interested in increasing an understanding that this is an organ-based disorder, mm -hmm. that drugs and alcohol affect the brain and they produce molecular changes in our brains mm -hmm. that develop uh, this problem of alcohol and substance use disorder. So this needs to be messaged from science in a number of different ways. Yeah, yeah I think that the science-driven thing is really important here, right? As I think that the messaging back, you know, in my younger days was, you know, the infomercial, this is your brain on drugs. And, and I don't think that that was always effective, right? Because people were exposed to drugs. They're like, that didn't happen. And so I think, you know, with social media, with the internet, there's ways to get people evidence-based information that isn't this propaganda of drugs are bad. It's this is how drugs work. I think actually one of the interesting things that we study, you know, everyone thinks about dopamine. You hear about dopamine, you know, it's like the one neurotransmitter that non-neuroscientists know. And dopamine's involved in just how we make decisions. But what drugs do is they increase dopamine. And so what they're doing is they're changing how you make decisions. They're changing how your brain is wired. So it's changing how decisions are made in the future. And so we need to help people figure out how to kind of rewire their brain in a way to help them make adaptive decisions. It's not some moral failing. It's drugs have caused plasticity in the way that we're making decisions. And so maybe you're not making the best decisions, but that isn't a moral problem. And so, you know, with other disorders, you see this too. And I think it's, it's important to talk about how it happens, why it happens, who is the most vulnerable, how do you get treatment in a way that gives people the information rather than trying to kind of scare them into don't do drugs because you'll go to jail or don't do drugs because of this, because none of that stuff has worked in the past. Because you'll go to hell. <laughs> well, right. And the thing is like, none of those, you know, my, my work, it focuses on punishments mm. and punishments. They don't work to reallocate behavior. They stop behavior maybe for a transient amount of time. And then when people go back into the world, they continue using drugs. And so yeah. these are not effective. Yeah. And so how do we do this? And, and we don't have all the answers. I wish we did. We talk about this all the time, but we don't have all the answers. But I think the discussion needs to start so that we can start solving the problem and figuring out through, you know, evidence, what worked, what didn't, where do we keep going? Yeah. Plus, some of us are just predisposed that if you tell me something is going to make me go to jail or make me go to hell, I'm definitely going to try it because it just sounds <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> one, yeah. One interesting um way that this really played out in the public discourse in a very broad way was through Hunter Biden. Um, yeah. So it was like, here is a, a, a uh, well, I don't want to be too presumptuous, but I think the story that we've understood is he's struggling with addiction or substance abuse issues. And to what extent not only is he um, a failed morality, but also how can that kind of be contagious to other people around you? So clearly um, uh, his father failed as well. And I'm really talking about this through the lens of the discussion we're having, not defending or uh, not through a, a Democrats or Republicans or a presidential election lens. Um, but it was just so interesting to see, much like um, in, in the George Floyd case, the way that um, the the uh, narrative that he was somehow, that, that he was in some way involved with drugs and alcohol, um, uh, that was being leveraged in a certain way. Um, similarly, in the presidential election, the, the fact of this, um, a relative with abuse issues was also being leveraged. And I thought uh, it was really interesting to see that play out. And it was kind of like a barometer for where are we on these things? Because like, you know, it's, to what extent can that be leveraged? To what extent does it stick? How does it not stick? What's the debate that, that, that emerges around that? Um, well, and this is why publications and conversations like GQ with these celebrities, having them sit down and say, I had a problem. 
this is how I dealt with it. Yeah. And having people who already have opinions of these people think they, they don't think they're bad people, but yeah. being able to see somebody who they already have a connection with say, yeah. I had a problem and then say, oh, well, they had a problem and I don't think they're a bad person. And so I think those conversations help people start to view it through a different lens. Like you can have a problem and deal with it and not have it ruin your life. You can have a problem and, and deal with it and it doesn't make you a bad person. And I think those conversations are such an important part. And they're things that we haven't seen in the media until really recently. These, yeah. these really honest conversations that are through a storytelling lens, right? So people really get a view of kind of what they're feeling and what they're thinking, not just- Do you uh, see an evolution of how that's uh, occurring and how um, members of the media and Hollywood are, are describing their stories and talking about the stories of others? Yeah, I mean, this is an area that we're really trying to lead on at GQ. And I think um, it, it must be the case that we really are leading on it because as we've done this work, it's really been recognized and applauded, which it's great to be recognized and applauded. But what that says to me is that not a lot of others in our position are, are yet doing this kind of thing. Um, so while it feels great, I think it's also, it feels great to me and my team. It's also a sign that we have a ways to go on um, tackling these, you know, doing this kind of storytelling being um, a broader norm. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. It's like, there's a bit of a competitive advantage there for us, but it would be better if, if more people were telling honest stories and more celebrities were using their platforms in, in these kind of compelling ways and more media outlets were using their platforms in, the, in these kinds of ways. Um, one thing that I think is interesting about this conversation is um, you guys, I, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I assume as you were coming up through school and so on, you guys had a natural sort of magnetism towards science and I had a natural magnetism towards writing and storytelling. And so we're both like, processing the, this information and, and sort of like using um, our, our gifts and interests in particular ways. But it's like, I try to do storytelling with a respect for science and where you guys are coming from is science with a respect for storytelling. And that I think is what could, and then if we add some, some positive public policy into the mix, suddenly we could be getting this kind of like multi-layered approach that could lead to actual change, which is the, of course the goal. I think you raise a really interesting point we've tried to focus on, Will, that, that you know, I think it's going to be on us scientists to try to make key discoveries that will change therapeutic opportunities mm -hmm. for people to, to beat this problem. Uh, but in terms of trying to raise awareness, it's really people in the media that can, mm -hmm. they're in the media for a reason, they really can best phrase and, and, and and turn that phrase on, on a key concept. And uh, we had an event a year or so ago where we had a number of poets come and talk mm. about uh, addiction from, uh, from their own personal experiences and, and other uh, perspectives, both uh, treating uh, uh, patients and, 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 and dealing with the issues in their family. And I, I thought it was really impactful to hear the way they framed these things. Yeah, uh, that makes me, th I was just watching the, the new Ken Burns uh, three-parter on Ernest Hemingway, who is like a pileup of all the things we're talking about, like substance abuse, sort of trapped himself in his own narratives about what masculinity looks like um, and sort of became, um, you know, it's really a, a, a tragic story um, about a guy who's, yeah, like compounding um, abuse issues with compounding, um, really harmful narratives about what a man what a man should behave like and then trying to behave to according to his own narrative and it got really um i i agree <laughs> you, you, you know you saw a lot of attempts at coping strategies uh, born yeah. out and and burns discussion of his life and uh, there's one thing i wanted to hear your thoughts about was you know with the pandemic especially the music industry and live events, you know, that industry is, is taken a huge hit in their ability to do their jobs, right? Yeah. And so there's been a lot of coping and adaptation that's had to occur during that year. And, and we always worry about the growth of 
alcohol and drug dependence during those periods of stress, because we think of stress as a major driver of reinstatement of, yeah. of, of drug use. And, and I was wondering what your thoughts were from your, uh, what you've uh, seen in interacting with, with people about how they've tried to adapt both in positive ways and maybe less positive ways. Yeah, I mean, as it goes with substance abu abuse issues, I've encountered it all. Um, I have friends, collaborators, um, uh, people who have been in the magazine and so on who have really found um, new energy behind their sobriety as a result of the pandemic. And that's for a host of different reasons. I think the, um, I mean, we're, we are leveraging the incredible technology. Uh, I'm in New York, you guys are, uh, I'm assuming you guys are in Nashville today and here we are doing this great panel together that we might not have thought would be possible if we weren't all in the same city. Um, similarly, uh, the sober community has, the and, and AA and NA community has just done incredible work with Zoom. Um, uh, I'll tell one personal story. I was on a, on a cross country drive with a, a dear friend of mine. Both of us um, identify as um, clean or sober, or, you know, everybody has different words for it, but, um, uh, and, each morning at uh, at 8 a.m. when we would get in the car for this drive across the country, we would like do a meeting on over Zoom through our phones, through the sound system in the car. And it was just a powerful daily, you know, starting the day with a meeting in a way that um, at a in a in circumstances in which we never could have done that. And I've just heard from so many people um in recovery about the way that zoom has just been zoom meetings have just been incredible for them powerful for them in some cases life-saving you know the only net that kept them from the edge and in other cases like it has really revivified my whole um uh sober identity and my process so that has been really exciting i mean at the other end of the spectrum to <laughs> To um, go back to a personal story, I also lost a dear friend during COVID who um, struggled throughout his life with substance abuse issues, an artist who struggled with substance abuse issues and, you know, was really uh, a yo-yo in terms of his, his recovery and relapse. And um, so we've really seen it all out there. Um, and I think that's true of so many elements of, of the pandemic, like, wow, there are these positive new tools and wow, there are these dangerous new um, unforeseen elements at play. So I would, I would argue that, yes, isolation um, is dangerous for people in recovery a thousand times out of a thousand, but there have been an awful lot of really beautiful narrative stories, realities to come as a result of COVID. So the hope is that um, you know, we can, like everything with, with COVID really across the spectrum, let's harness what we've learned um, and also work together, use science, use storytelling, et cetera, to power through the stuff that is purely detrimental and the trauma um, and, and hopefully come out of this stronger than we were going into it, which I, you know, I'm an eternal opt optimist. So I certainly believe that that is the case. Well, this certainly resonates with a recent interview that Aaron and I did with uh, the artist Langhorn Slim, who yeah. describes his uh, uh, increased creativity and, and uh, produced a really nice album uh, that was released just a couple of months ago. And we'll be uh, posting that interview at a later date. But uh, I, I, I can't wait to tune into that. That's right up my alley. And I know artists who have been their most prolific over the last 15 months. And I know artists who can't move a creative muscle. So, yeah. And so what do you think are the changes that are likely to persist from these adaptations as a huge industry of entertainment has had to completely retool itself and, and try to adapt to this new reality as we start to move towards what a, a vaccinated culture might look like, uh, what, what do you think will be retained? Yeah, I, I think there are, um, there are, of course, dangers to the way that uh, we're all going to come hurtling out of lockdown and this period of, of isolation. And you hear it all the time. People can't wait to get back to partying and, you know, all of it, which is a beautiful thing and a dangerous thing uh, if you see the world through the lens that, that we share on this call. Um, 
but I think for the for the arts for musicians, um, it's so important that we get people back to work, um, and that those of us I'm I'm like a true music fan. Like it is part of what uh, feeds me. I would say is just experiencing live music. So I'm coming in from the fan side, and there are a lot of people like me. And then from the music side, it, you know, it's really dangerous when people are down out and out of work. Um, from a substance abuse perspective. Um, so yeah, while getting out there and partying and be gathering and being together and drugs and alcohol are everywhere, that is concerning. For me, the bigger concern is um, a whole, whole industries of people who have been unable to do their jobs um, and the, danger, the substance abuse dangers that, that could be associated with that. I mean, how are you guys thinking about um, uh, you know, from your research perspective or from what you've learned from your research about what coming out of lockdown might might look like? Yeah, I think, well, so I think one of the things that that was kind of bad at the beginning of the pandemic is, is uh, in the center, like we've all done a lot of work on different factors that increase drug use. Yeah. So social isolation, stress yeah. increases drug use. So think about all the stressors, right? the rapid change in like what people were doing, the lost jobs, the uncertainty that increases drug use. So essentially what happened is like everything together happened at the same time. And we saw increases in drug use. We saw increases in opioid overdose deaths. We saw increases in alcohol consumption. Yep. And so, you know, this was scary. And so I think that, you know, going back, it'll be important to kind of think about how that's going to affect people. I think now, you know, have reducing that will probably decrease drug use in some people, but like you said, other people whose drug use centers around social events and yeah. things like that may go back up. And so I think it's going to have to be, you know, something where we carefully think about what drives drug use, how do we intervene? How can we make it like, you know, something that people can uh, think about kind of safely and educate in an educated yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but the pandemic was not great for that. And so oh, now okay. it's ending, which is good, but I think that we're going to have new challenges. And the other thing too, is the increase in drug use. If that's creating people who are starting to have problems, yeah. we're going to have issues that are not going to go away when the pandemic goes away. These oh. are going to be things that we're dealing with as a medical community, as a society right. for many years as kind of blowback for this, which I think is scary, really, but it's something we have to reckon yeah. with. The other problem is that, you know, as you've, as you've mentioned that, you know, drugs and alcohol are, are, are permeating uh, uh, many cultures, right? The, they're, they're ubiquitous in various ways. Uh, and, and many people uh, can utilize alcohol, uh, uh, substances of abuse and not develop a full-blown addiction, right? Uh, the problem is that, you know, that significant 20% number or so who do, right now we really lack the tools to accurately predict, right? Mm -hmm. And so that it would be a great thing going forward if we, is if we could, you know, determine better ways to predict at-risk individuals who mm. have those vulnerabilities. Yeah. That, that's actually something that the center has some expertise in. Uh, Cody Siciliano is another uh, re recent recruit into the center and has really interesting data uh, looking at active activity of specific brain pathways that might predict vulnerability in interesting ways. Yeah, I mean, that would be a huge breakthrough if um, people could learn early on in their, you know, experiences <laughs> I, hesitate, I was almost going to use the buzzword of the moment journey <laughs> with their drug and alcohol journey if early in your journey you could be told that you have a predisposition to um, a, an abuse problem or addiction um, that would be a phenomenal new tool and one thing um, I've experienced uh, anecdotally I guess you could say that I'm dying to hear from you guys on is um, well uh, uh, New York's has recently moved in. Uh, the, my vocabulary is going to fail me in, in, in terms of exactly what phase we're in right now, but the legalization of marijuana is on in New York. And uh, New York City is a place where you could obviously smell weed smoke all the time on the street. Now it's um, fairly, I would say, ubiquitous. I, I've noticed a real difference just in the past couple of weeks since um, the announcement about these changing uh, uh, legal positions came out. And I just think this is really interesting. I 
am not a scientist and I'm not a researcher and I don't have anything to back this up other than my own gut. But for me, if what we're talking about is the importance of destigmatization, one way to do that or one uh, huge element in the stigmatization of, of drugs is the fact that they're illegal. And we get, we get told early on that, you know, you're going to jail and that these things are evil. And of course, some of them are illegal or some of them packaged certain ways are illegal and others are actually uh, prescribed to us by doctors and sold for profit. So it's like this insane, confusing, mixed message system. This leads me, an ignorant person, <laughs> to feel that there could be really interesting destigmatization results from legalization. So I'm a person who abstains from drugs and alcohol, but I actually, if you put a ballot in front of me right now and said vote, I would say legalize it all. So <laughs> I toss that to you guys who actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> Well, we're definitely, uh, I, yeah, I'm of two minds on, on this mm -hmm. issue because on the one hand, I completely agree with you that you know, decriminalization has the opportunity to add to the destigmatization yeah. of discussing problems around substance use uh, that, that would be useful. I completely agree with that. My concern is around the margins of, of what happens uh, with uh, especially increased adolescent use and increased usage at higher doses. You know, yeah. So as you move into decriminalization and move into other ways of providing uh, THC through edibles and things of that nature, the dosing starts to become uh, problematic in terms of how much THC people are getting in their systems. And you know, the, this is compounded by the fact that uh, marijuana THC are schedule one compounds according to the Drug Enforcement Agency. Yep. And this makes it incredibly difficult for scientists to actually rigorously study what these drugs of abuse do to the brain. Uh, and so uh, we had a recent uh, VCAR Science Day here before the pandemic where we had uh, Meg Haney from Columbia down to talk about mm -hmm. these issues and, and people from other parts of the country. And this is the, the just the repeated ring is this problem of getting good data on what's, what's going on. But right. you think there's enormous potential there because THC works on an endogenous transmitter in your brain. You know, we, uh, uh, Aaron mentioned dopamine is one of these transmitters. So the endocannabinoid system is sort of a reverse neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dr. Sachin Patel here in the center and in psychiatry is a leader uh, in this field and, and looking at the way in which that endocannabinoid system can be used to modulate stress responses and potentially reduce alcohol seeking behavior. Uh, and so the, to the degree that we can gain the ability to better study these things, uh, that'll help us weigh in better on this question. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, one of the interesting things Danny kind of touched on is that not only is it really hard for us to get the drug to study the drug we can get. So the way we get our drugs this is actually a cool fun fact is actually through like the government. Mm -hmm. So I get my drugs from the government. They make it for me and they send them to me and I have like a DEA license and there's all this paperwork, like studying drugs is not easy, yeah. but the THC we get, it's not the same as what people are taking because now that you have some of this legalization, you have different contents of mm -hmm. THC versus CBD versus this and that, mm -hmm. and we can get only certain kinds. So we're not even studying really the exact same things that people are taking. Right. How, how is CBD work? You know, CBD is everywhere now. Yeah. What is it doing? How does it affect your brain? And so, you know, Sacha Patel, who's the cannabinoid guy here is also looking at that and trying to figure out what does it even doing to brain cells. And, and we actually just don't have all of the answers. And I think that's what's scary for us as researchers that with other drugs, we can say, we know what it does. We know what the consequences are. We know what percentage of people this will happen with. But with this, we, we just do not have the answer. And then the other thing too, is when you're thinking about decriminalization, I think one important thing too, to think of with our, our, our justice system is when someone's coming with a ton of drug offenses, should we be putting them in jail or should we have something else where we're actually saying, okay, this person has a problem and they need to go into treatment. And actually Biden had touched on this in, during some of the election discussions yeah. and basically was saying that we shouldn't be just incarcerating people who are coming back and back and back with these drug offenses. We should be getting them help. And I think thinking about how we deal with people with drug related problems, how we prosecute those, I think is also a problem because when you go to jail for a drug offense, you come out and now it's harder to get 
a job. It's yeah. harder to, to kind of face, we go back into society. And so I think we need to think about retooling the whole system. Yeah. And this is a place I think to start. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I do feel I already de declared myself as an internal optimist. Um, and I do feel that it takes so much hard work by all of us, you know, I think there's that expression that the arc of history bends towards progress, but it's really people doing the work that that bends it that way if it, if it does indeed bend. Um, but it, I don't know, I, I am feeling more hopeful on this as there seems to at the very least be a more dynamic discourse around all of these in, interconnected things, which include substance abuse, legalization, criminalization, you know, the, the, the effects on society of the criminal justice system and so on. I, I, it's certainly, if you think back, you know, to, um, I don't know, you can, you can put the pen anywhere in the, in the calendar. If you think back towards any time, it does seem like we're having a more dynamic conversation now than we were before, although there, every day there are new setback, you know, fast forwards and setbacks, I guess. But it's frustrating to say something more specific, Aaron, to hear that you guys are sort of handcuffed and necessarily behind the curve and that anybody on the street can go buy something and use it and you guys can't go buy it to study. And this it. is That's even in cities that this is even in cities that have legal right. marijuana. So yeah. like the researchers in like Boulder, Colorado cannot yeah. just go, even though they personally could just buy it, yeah. they can't use it for research. So it is, there are, you know, I think we're ahead of the curve in a lot of places thinking about how to solve problems, but in certain places, just based on rules and regulations, we're behind. And I think we need to invest as a community or as a government in saying, okay, this is moving towards legalization. Maybe we should be investing more in the research yes. of what this is doing yeah. on the Le that level yeah before somebody like somebody ignorant like me just hits the button <laughs> <laughs> well this has been a great conversation and and uh again appreciate everyone who's tuned in and and we got some uh great uh questions that have come in and uh want to just take a moment and and read some of those off so that we can uh, uh answer a few of these and um start off with uh one this one um has there been a greater impact on women versus men? I can take some of that. Please, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, so I actually, the, I need this to do my work. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to so, take notes. Okay, so one of the things that's, so my lab, so I'll just start by saying like, you know, when you think about gender, gender is kind of your identity. Do you identify as a man or a woman? But biological sex is kind of, do you have an X, X or XY chromosomes? And so in my lab, because we study preclinical systems, we focus on biological sex as a, a, not always risk factor, but kind of how is it interfering with drugs? One of the really kind of interesting things that we, we've seen is that stimulant drugs like cocaine are actually more effective at increasing dopamine in women. And there's these really interesting interactions with ovarian hormones. So you've heard of estrogens. And so estradiol is an estrogen. And what it does is it interacts with what cocaine is doing and it actually makes it more potent in women. And so a lot of the, the clinical work has shown that women represent a particularly vulnerable population, um, especially for certain subclasses of drugs. So they take more drug, they transition to addiction faster, they have more problems with abstinence. And so they're also more affected by stress and stress-induced relapse. And so when you're seeing this kind of pandemic, child care is falling a lot on women. Women actually represented one of the largest populations of lost jobs over the pandemic. You're going to see this interaction with this kind of baseline increased vulnerability, as well as increased stressors on women as well. And so I think it's something we should be thinking about. And actually, you know, Will, this is a question for you. When, when you guys publish articles on, on kind of women and men talking about, you know, addiction, yeah. are they received differently? Do, do you guys get different kinds of feedback from these articles? And is there more of a stigma kind of on that side for women talking about addiction versus men? And like, how do people view that? Yeah. I mean, we've really been, um, 
taking it as one of the topics that we're extremely interested in is just challenging these ideas of gender norms and looking to sort of like deconstruct them rather than uphold them. But when we do a story um, like uh, Clean, which was the, the one we talked at, at, the, at the top, talked about at the, t at the top of our discussion um, about the uh, musicians who identify in some way as sober, um, we talk to, we always are looking to talk to um, at least a mix of men and women, if not also including trans and gender non-binary um, uh, subjects. And, uh, but I would say it's, we've been breaking down this idea of GQ as a quote unquote men's magazine. I really see GQ not as a men's magazine, but we have a particular point of view and things we're interested in. And it's for anybody who is interested in seeing through that point of view. Um, but because of this sort of like historical men's magazine perspective, um, we tend to feature more men than women and have, um, while we have probably more um, when, uh, uh, readers who identify as women than uh, most anyone would imagine, we do have still have majority men. So the conversation tends to evolve around these kind of like stereotypes of masculine behavior. Um, but it's like incredibly interesting for me to hear, given that that is um, the focus of the way we think about this new era of GQ, that actually uh, for cocaine, which obviously has um, is a is a huge part of the narrative around rock and roll, um, for instance, that uh, there's actually um, a greater potency for women like that. That is fascinating. Um, and it's really interesting to hear how the science both affirms and contradicts these kind of received norms and assumptions. Well, and that talks about kind of societal kind of pressures as well, right? Yeah. Because if you look it's normalizing, but if you look at like drug use, men, but up until recently made up a larger percentage mm -hmm. of stimulant users. Yeah. But if you controlled for that, women were the more vulnerable population. Right. So there's obviously societal factors driving yeah. which drugs are used by which genders and when and how yeah. much, but then there's the biological factors that are saying who is vulnerable. And those right. may not be the same yeah. and so it's kind of this also has to go into how we're treating people and thinking about yeah. it kind of what factors are affecting what yeah, how but it's such a position of power to be a, or a position of advantage to actually be able to parse the difference right and it's hard yeah. and i think that's what yeah. people are trying to do and i think it's uh important so yeah yeah so here's another one uh why did we get all get so uh depressed and artsy during covid quarantine yeah. And uh, you know, I think there are a lot of answers for the depressed part, but I think that uh, it's interesting to think about this idea of altered creativity that you yeah. have already touched on a little bit, Will. Yeah, um, I just think, you know, um, I'm trying to think <laughs> about whether where my head is going, how relevant it is to the, to the actual topic of our discussion, but I just think that um, we all have creative selves. And some of us, our creativity veers towards the sciences and some towards the arts or humanities and so on. And I just think that there was a um, really powerful, something that um, my wife and I talk about a lot is that um, it's very hard to get bored anymore because you can just get on your phone and just like blast your blast your brain out and you're, I don't, I'm going to say the wrong receptors, guys, help me, your dopamine receptors. Uh, blast dopamine your, works for everything. Yeah, okay, it does. Cool. All right. <laughs> you know, the dope of the iPhone is powerful. Um, but I think, you know, we all just sort of tapped into our creative selves because of the, the boredom and the isolation. And that to me is one of those silver linings that has come out. And I think a lot of us, the, um, my own narrative around this is is a little a little a little of each, but a lot of people just get told they're not creative at all growing up, and I think that's really harmful. Um, and in a way, we you know this pandemic like uh, reverted many of us to our like child our inner children our our child selves, and suddenly like um, a little bit of like playful art time became permissive when many of us uh, would otherwise never have allowed 
uh, that for ourselves because we were told we were like, you know, needed to be corporate accountants and and couldn't be creative if we tried, which I think is just absolute. Since we're talking about myth busting, uh, that would be a good one while we're here. I, I struggle to, to connect that to addiction, forgive me. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I, I think we'll, we'll uh, start to wrap up on that. And it, it's been a real pleasure to speak with Aaron and Will today about these really important topics. And Will, thanks a lot uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I hope everyone in attendance has is, is gained a, a better appreciation of the problems that addiction creates in our society. And hopefully it starts to feel more comfortable discussing this topic. Uh, it's conversations like these that are gonna help break the stigma and start to turn this tide. And we will certainly continue to have these conversations through our center, uh, including releasing uh, soon the, the interview we recorded with the artist Langhorn Slim that I mentioned, uh, and then a live event in the fall with the artist uh, Jason Isbell as well. Uh, I hope you've also gained an appreciation for uh, the way that brain sciences might start to bring some uh, hope in this area and encourage you to follow our center's activities on Twitter through uh, at VCAR Science and through our VCAR Science website to stay informed. Um, and lastly, if you or someone you know is struggling with alcohol or substance abuse, we encourage you to reach out to resources for help. Uh, one excellent starting place on campus is Vanderbilt Recovery Support. Uh, their website that provides lines to a variety of web resources to help treatment seeking individuals. And, and with that, we'd like to thank you all for listening in today and for your interesting questions. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, Thanks Danny. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> See ya. Bye.